Welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show. Uh, Tricia Gelman, CMO at Drift, and Brian Carden, also CMO, but at Envision. Welcome both. Thanks for having me. Uh, Thanks, great, great to have you both. I haven't had two CMOs on the podcast uh, before, so this is a, a SaaS Revolution Show first, but I am uh, super excited to, to speak with you both, learn from you both. Uh, and this is, uh, I guess, in advance uh, of uh, Blueprint for CMOs, which is happening on March the 30th uh, online, uh, where we've got a whole host of, I think, probably the best CMOs in SaaS uh, speaking, uh, uh, which including both of yourself are, are speaking. Uh, so really appreciate that. Um, uh, looking forward to that event. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it myself. I've um, known several of the people and had them on my own podcast, but they always have things that are interesting to share. So I can't wait to listen. It's a great lineup and I agree, like I'm going to be part of it, uh, not just speaking, but listening and learning a ton of things from Trisha too. I love the work you're doing at Drift. I'm a big follower of yours and the great marketing. And so I think marketers learn from other marketers. So it looks like a great event, Alex. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and actually, not only do we have, I, I think it's around, you know, 14, 15 of some, some of the best CMOs in SaaS, you know, at the moment. Uh, but also we're, we're getting, you know, 200 CMOs that are coming to participate and learn from each other, which is going to be, you know, make for a fantastic uh, uh, event uh, itself with the networking and that just having so many CMOs in one place, even though it's not online, uh, uh, will be uh, something really to look forward to. So today we're going to uh, talk about the top mistakes that first time CMOs make. Uh, and so I think it's going to make for a really interesting conversation. Uh, I think we'll come up with sort of three, four, perhaps sort of, you know, mistakes that you see commonly that uh, first time CMOs make. So Tricia, why don't you uh, sort of kick off with one of the ones that, uh, that springs to mind? Yeah, I think this is a great topic. We actually did our first party research last year where we um, went out and asked CMOs, like, what are the top things that you actually see and what are your challenges? We wanted to kind of in the pandemic and the world being so different, get a, get a gauge on how have things changed or not changed. And honestly, things were more stressful in the past year as a CMO with, you know, ever changing um, activity. But in the end of the day, things were really the same. And I think one thing I want to make sure that we talk about is the fact that 45% of CMOs said they weren't aligned with leadership. And I see this all the time in that marketers aren't really aligned to the right goals. And then it's not the things that the board or the CEO care about. And so I think this is something really important to pay attention to. Like, it's great to do fun and interesting marketing, but who cares and who are your stakeholders? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Sometimes marketing is talking one language and the board and the sales team is talking another. They're completely disjointed. And so I think marketers are sort of into their own numbers. Look how many MQLs, look at my conversion rate. But sales team Turks talks not in front of contacts. They talk a lot about accounts. Um, salespeople care a lot about pipeline. Uh, I think marketers talk a lot about content and look how much engagement we got. So I think they got to be on the same language. And I think it's up to marketers to uh, level up their language to make sure it's what the board is, is wants to hear and also what the sales team needs to hear. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think as marketers, um, especially if you're like, you know, building out your team for the first time, you really pride yourself on listening to your product team and listening to your audience of like, what is it that they need to hear? But then marketers are deaf to their own audience, right? Like who are the stakeholders that you're working with in marketing itself? And what do they want to hear? I see people on my team all the time going to sales and telling them every single thing that marketing is doing. And for a salesperson, that's just like over their head, way too much noise. They don't engage with you. They don't do anything. But if you can identify the clear, crisp things that they care about, like, hey, we're going to do this webinar. It's specifically for this audience that you've been trying to get in with. And then this is the output, the result that we think we'll get which is the same result you want, i.e. revenue, then, you know, everything gets aligned and then everybody's aligned at the leadership level, et cetera. And I think on the board level, I think uh, whenever I start a new job, I meet several board members. I'm sure you do as well, Tricia. I'm trying to get a sense like, uh, how do you like marketing to report uh, in their results? What does a dashboard look like? And most of them have examples of how they like to see the numbers. And very often you can sort of match what they're used to seeing. And that really helps a lot. So making sure you're very at the board level, talking the right language, and certainly with the sales team. Yeah, I think the key thing there is setting the expectation. Um, I did have an experience once where I thought we should talk about source pipeline and influence pipeline. And as I was prepping for the board meeting, I realized, 
no one in the entire leadership team had ever spoken about these metrics. And I realized that's not going to be the right thing. You don't want to bring up new statistics, new language, et cetera, for the first time when you're sitting there in front of the board. Absolutely. Can I throw in a uh, one yep. of my mistakes? And by the way, I've made all these mistakes. Not about you, Tricia, but I've made some oh, yeah, for of sure. all these. And that's how we learn. And it's so painful when you make them. And you see more junior marketers making the mistakes. So uh, a mistake that I see is CMOs not moving fast enough. And there are all these books about the first 90 days, 100 days. Well, baby, the clock is ticking and you got to make stuff happen. You know, if you've got to redo your team, you got to be interviewing people right away because it's going to take you months to find the right person. They got to be onboarded. And so um, even before I start a job, I start figuring out the talent and I start interviewing people before I start. So I think time is not our friend. Uh, also, this idea of quick wins and associating your name with something that happens in the first 90 days uh, really matters. Like, oh, Trish is the person who really made this happen, or she completely changed our dashboards, or she did this. So being known for something and getting that momentum early, uh, if they have to wait six months or nine months to see results of a new CMO, that's just way too long. I think that's super important, especially in hyper growth companies, because the company is moving so fast. There's no way that they want to be excited to make their CMO or VP of marketing hire and then not see anything for six months. And I think that's so important to lay out a strategy. So you're not just looking at what am I delivering in 30 or 60 days just to check that box, but think about what is your big strategy and what can you do to show momentum against it? with the quick wins. I think whether that's, you know, as a beginning of your role as a CMO or ongoing, I think it's super important, especially if you're in a tech hyper growth company. Are there, are there any examples that you both can share of the, you know, the first 90 days and the quick wins that, that you brought to both uh, Drift and Envision? Yeah, I did one. Um, you know, every marketer says they talk to customers and most marketers never talk to customers. They talk to the marketing team. And so I made a concerted effort to talk some for customers. And I, I was involved in a deal that actually closed and won. And the salesperson, when they did the win report, they credited me, the marketer, with helping to get that deal across the finish line. So suddenly the reputation is, Brian's a closer. Bring him on in sales deals. The sales team loves him. So I didn't really do much. I just sort of showed up and said a few things. And uh, But that reputation really happens. So it's one thing if you have a campaign or you've done it. But if you specifically help close a deal, there's nothing that resonates more in an organization than a CMO who cares about closing deals. And that was a really super hit win for me. Yeah, I think one of the key things there too is like, what do you want to be known for? What is sort of your brand that you're trying to portray as well? I think this idea of, you know, marketing being a closer, being an exec sponsor in a deal is great at Drift. I mean, I came to Drift because it's about transforming sales and marketing and how they work together. And I pride myself on being a marketer who aligns well with sales. So I came to Drift West Coast office, executive sponsor of the West Coast office. It's basically a sales office. And what I found is that the team was talking to pretty low level people in the organization where they were selling. They were successful at it, but imagine what you can do if you, if you talk to the CMO to buy a tool that drives revenue for the CMO. And so I was able to come in right away and connect through my network to some of those CMOs. And I also identified that we didn't have the right messaging for CMOs. We didn't have messaging that was at a high enough level. And so I would say that's like one of my quick wins is we kind of needed to change our sales process. So it wasn't just low level, it was low level and high level, thinking about sort of that fan of people because we know that there's a buying committee today, but it wasn't sort of the DNA of how we functioned at Drift. And so immediately I went into deals where I could help with my network. And then I helped to develop messaging so that we had messaging for different personas and then value messaging. So we weren't talking so much about features and price, and we were actually able to command more value within the market by talking about the pains that people have. Um, you know, that's a long project to develop that messaging, to bring it into sales enablement, to tra train your entire team. And so just showing those quick wins and kind of getting those salespeople saying, oh yeah, I did that with Trisha in a deal. And like, this really worked. We should all start talking about this. I did something similar, Trisha, um, but it was a very physical thing at my last company where we actually had offices and uh, my second day, I plot myself in the middle of the BDR team. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to listen to all your calls and I want to take some calls and I want to, you know, handle and, and see what's going on. And people took pictures of me. It was, it was almost like, uh, 
you know, like a, like an like like something they've never seen in nature before. You know, like some <laughs> amazing black swan or some like thing. Oh my God! A marketer who is with these lowly BDRs, these junior kids who are dialing, and it's a very hard job. And he wants to understand what our life is like and what our dashboards are like and and how we go to market. And uh, and like you did, I wrote down a lot of things and what's successful, what isn't. But it was more the effort that I wasn't just sitting over across in the marketing team with my peeps. I went over to the sales and most importantly, the front lines, the BDRs who were doing the outbounding. Yeah, there's so much to be learned from the BDRs. Trisha, what about uh, uh, another mistake that you, you commonly see? Yeah, I mean, I think the majority of marketers, at least 50% in our study say that they don't have the right data to make decisions. And so I think some people come in and on this idea of doing things fast and moving quickly, you know, they just start doing things and they aren't that worried about the data, but this is going to bite you in the butt, right? I mean, like, let's just be real. If you don't have the right data in the beginning, and then you start to be wildly successful, at least you think you are, you start doing things and then you realize, oh my God, I have more and more and more data and going and cleaning that data up becomes an effort on its own. So I think really thinking about like, what are these metrics? What does the board care about? What does the CEO care about? What does your CRO care about? What is it that you are truly responsible for and that you can actually hold your team accountable to and put in the effort to build the operations and build the analytics to make sure you can report on that all the time. You know, the analytics is such an unglamorous part of the job. And also, uh, I feel it's like building a house. If you've got a foundation that's cracked, you can build up and up and it's just going to start tilting and be a mess. And so I've seen marketers move too fast. They did not have a good foundation. They're looking at bad reporting, bad analytics, and they're making decisions on horrible data. And then six months or eight months in, they realize and they have to redo it all. And it's almost like a fresh start. None of the data is comparable. And so unfortunately with the data and the integrity, you got to go slow to go fast, make sure it's right, make sure the reporting is good. And, uh, but it's an unglamorous part of the job, but you have to do it right or nothing else matters. Yeah, I think um, like an example of sort of the last point and this point together is when I was at a previous role, like we didn't have any operational systems. We didn't really know. I came in and I had to build an annual plan and I literally had no data. Like, okay, we just have like, people coming to the website. That's it. And so it makes it really hard, right? To say, oh, I'm going to spend, you know, X amount of dollars and this is a return I'm going to get. You have no idea. So what I did was I kind of set out, okay, an agreement with the CEO and the head of sales. What is it that we want to do? Like, what is marketing accountable for? What is our process? Do we have MQLs? Do we have SQLs? What's the criteria for all of these different gates to get through, et cetera? And then we just started doing things. And I told the team, I want you to do activities with a goal in mind. Okay, we're going to do our first ABM campaign. We expect that to convert at 30%. Everyone freaked out. 30%. Oh my God, we've never done this before. I said, 30% is the average for an ABM campaign. Why are we doing it if it's not the average? Let's do it and let's learn from it. If we only do 10% conversion, why did we only do 10% conversion? And you can start to take each of these individual pieces and do the activities to then build up to the whole. Today's day and age, marketers need to sign up for revenue. And that is the fur furthest thing from what you can do with spending your money. So maybe you can't figure out how you're connecting to revenue in the beginning, but if you have that goal in mind, at least you can start with the first thing, which is like, I ran an ad and did it convert? And then you can build out the operational system to know that you're trying to get to revenue. Trisha, I really like this culture you built of experimentation and trying things. Like, okay, so you set a goal to 30%. If we hit 10%, let's understand why or why not and always getting better. I think a lot of marketers feel that every child has to be above average and it's not. Some campaigns just aren't going to perform well, but it's almost an embarrassment to talk about poor performing campaigns. But I think great performing marketing teams are totally transparent about what's working and what's not working. And they just talk about it and get better all the time. And I like that culture you put in Adrift. Yeah, thanks. I also think that in today's day and age, especially with all the change we're seeing every single month, you have to be innovating all the time. It's really important that you put money aside. This could be another sort of, okay, like what is the thing that I did wrong? If you only budget to do what you think is gonna work, you're gonna have a huge mistake, which is that you're not gonna grow. You're gonna hit a wall and you're gonna realize like these things that were working for me three months ago, they're not working at the rate they were before or they are not working at all or that we're not getting to the goal. So you need to cut aside 10%, 20% of your budget and your people's time 
to actually do experimentation and to innovate. And these things are not going to always work, but this is how you're going to learn. This is how you're going to discover that next thing that's going to be the next step, the next step in order to maintain that ongoing growth. I think the innovation also gets the team really excited. Like they want to do new things. Like after you've been doing the same old, same old, like part of your job is to invest in your team. And by trying new techniques or new processes or deploying new technologies, people feel, wow, look what I'm learning here. And they want to stick around and do some of these new things. So I think also doing new things is a great retention tool for the marketing team. Yeah. I also think that that is a good lesson, which is, you know, mistake of just focusing on the numbers, just focusing on getting the things done and not focusing on your team. You have to hire. We talked about hiring. Hiring is a huge part of your job, whether it's the first day or whether it's like, you know, five years in. But you also have to invest in the team because team culture and the team excitement and energy that they bring to the table is directly reflected in your brand and in the quality of your marketing. On the on the hiring, what um, what mistakes uh, do you see or have you seen, whether it's yourself personally or in the market that that CMOs make when building out the, the team for the business? One thing I see is a mistake that I've made is a terrific individual contributor, but not a team player. And so they're just kicking butt. They're doing amazing, but they're just causing such friction with the rest of the team. And uh, I had to let, you know, in my career, I've let people go for this, you know, so they're risk rocking it. They just do amazing work, but when they collaborate, they're a horrible collaborator and creates a toxic environment. So sometimes you have to index, maybe they're not an A++, they're really amazing player, but they really index very highly on collaboration because what's more of a team sport than marketing? Everybody's got to really work together and we spend so many hours working together, we got to really enjoy it. And so that kind of person who uh, is not, doesn't have high emotional intelligence can really hurt the whole team. Yeah, I would agree. I would say the other thing is that I think people think short term and you have to have a mix of thinking short term and long term. And it kind of goes back to motivating the team too. Like people want to know where do I fit in the organization and where is where am I going? Is there an opportunity here for me? So you have to think, okay, maybe you're in, you know, an early stage startup. You don't know how much money you have. You don't know if you're even going to, you know, get right market fit, but either way, I think in a year from now, like what is our goal as a company for a year from now? And what is the team going to need to look like then? So you're hiring the people that are going to grow you into that team that you need to have in a year. I think I've made the mistake before of hiring the super A plus plus person for what I need right now, but then that's not the person that I need in another year. And it's hard to build an organization around that person, which creates its own conflict because the person maybe owns so much, but really they're not seen enough to then lead a group of people or something in that in that vein. The other hiring thing I try to do, and I'm sure you do it as well, Trisha, is that I'm always in the market talking to talent. You know, something I learned from Mike Volpe over at HubSpot, like I said, you know, how do you hire such great people? He says, because I'm always talking to people. So every week, even though we may not have an opening spot or he's doesn't have an opening for six months, he is nurturing just like we do with prospects. He's nurturing talent all the time and getting a sense because people have a window that pops up, like they wanna leave and that doesn't come about very often. And you gotta really have built that relationship when they raised their hand and said, I think it's time for a move. So I always have, you know, four to five people that I'm in some stage of conversation. Uh, You know, I find it more challenging, you know, purely on Zoom. I used to love to get good coffee or if I'm in San Francisco or if I'm in London, it's more challenging to have like a casual on Zoom but you still have to do it and invest it. So I explicitly block times in my calendar and I schedule time with people that I think are high talent. And the other thing I do is some of my favorite marketers, I say, who was the best hire you've ever made in your career? Who is the single best hire? And I get just amazing people from that. And I've got to know those people and I've hired a few. And the other thing I've done is, I don't know about you, Tricia, but I love to take inbound calls from uh, BDRs, from other companies, just to see, how good they are, how bad they are. You know, like some nervous person gets a CMO on the phone and they said, I want to schedule a meeting with you, Mr. Carden. And I say, now's the meeting. You got a minute. And I take those because I'm like an anthropologist. I just want to see, see them in the wild, see how they perform. Can I learn something about the outreach? It's like, I used to collect direct mail letters. Like what's a really good letter or what's a really good subject head on the envelope or something. But in my career, I've actually hired two BDRs who cold called me. They were just amazing. And I scheduled a meeting. I saw how they were setting it up. And I actually, I wasn't at all interested in what they were selling, but they got a meeting with me and they're very persuasive and I've hired two of them. So I really enjoy that. 
Yeah, I think um, experience with what other people are doing. Um, that's why I think, you know, the event is the blueprint event is great is listening to what other people are doing. It's just such a great way to learn. It really makes you think differently about what you thought you were doing great. But then back to that innovation, you're like, oh, wow, if I took that and that and I put it together, it would be unique to me, but it would, you know, maybe really transform what it is that I'm doing. Yeah, uh, I mean, just looping back to what Brian said, uh, I, I love that idea of just taking those cold, cold calls from the BDRs, right? And uh, I need to perhaps uh, adopt that because I'm just constant, you know, whenever I see that number and I don't recognize it, I'm not answering the phone. But actually, um, you know, there could be some uh, uh, benefits there, or, or certainly there are if you're making a couple of hires uh, uh, from that. Uh, fantastic stuff. And uh, Brian, um, you know, uh, what about uh, any, any other sort of mistakes that you've got on your list that, uh, that you want to share? Oh, yeah. Here, here's a really good one. Uh, you know, we all work really hard to have a great relationship with the head of sales. But I find that really a powerful person, a great partner is the CFO, the financial person. Because at some point, the CEO is going to turn and say to the CFO, what do you think of my head of marketing? Are they a good steward of the brand? Are they managing the money well? Do I get an ROI? And you need a thumbs up. Uh, and so I get my CFO involved in all of my data, all my reporting. I'll talk to them about, you know, how would you calculate CAC and lifetime value? I'm thinking about my cost per MQL or cost per opportunity. So the finance team is very involved in how I calculate everything and we're very transparent with them. And I find when I need a little extra budget or I need something special, they're my friend. So building that relationship with the CFO, I think is something not enough marketers do. So you put your thumbs up there, Tricia. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. And I think something that people don't realize, it kind of goes into a point I'll cover in a minute, but marketers and CFOs in the company outside of the CEO are the two roles that actually touch across the entire company. And so I truly believe that there's a great partnership to be made between the CMO and the CFO. I mean, if you want to help to drive a new strategy, partner with the CFO. He's trying to look at new strategies all the time to drive the revenue and balance the books and, you know, do whatever the numbers may be for future IPO or exit. And so um, marketers, they have the ability to work with sales, with marketing, with customer success, with product, everybody. And the CFO is working with every one of those teams and has people on their team supporting them as well. So it's a great partnership. And I think marketers have to be good at spending money. That's also something I think that people fail at is how do you spend money and show results? But really, how do you spend money? I think it's like 50-50 on marketers about whether they have the mindset to be able to manage the budget and do the work. I think there's too often an adversary relationship, like the marketers spend the money and the CFO is trying to, you know, they actually have the same goal in mind. They really want to have as much pipeline, as much productivity of those dollars. So I agree with you. I think you know, if you can have a good relationship with a CFO, I think that's golden and really will help you. And I really hadn't thought about how aligned they are in terms of new growth initiatives. Like the CFO, they want to get creative. They want to figure out how to grow the business. And that's a good partner. Uh, something I, I want to uh, chip in with a, an observation that I've kind of seen o over the last sort of 12 months. And again, I don't know, I welcome your feedback in terms of how accurate this is. But one thing I noticed, certainly, you know, when, um, oh, well, I think you clearly did, but when, when COVID kind of swept across uh, the world and, you know, the pandemic started, it was first had, you know, the first wave as such. And uh, a lot of companies, you know, in that kind of fear and uncertainty and kind of planning for the future started to make cuts, right, you know, straight away. And one of the roles that was kind of cut first, it, it kind of seemed, was the CMO. Uh, you know, in a, in a lot of uh, uh, organizations. So it, it's something that I saw. I don't know entirely how accurate it is. So I kind of welcome your feedback if that's something that you also kind of saw. And then I also, I feel like I read something again, like over the last kind of 12 months uh, that, you, you know, the, the kind of the average tenure for a CMO is something like, you know, 18 months, uh, you know, within a business. And it's kind of one of these uh, roles that, you know, there's huge amounts of pressure, uh, you know, and there, there, you know, there isn't that kind of long tenure. So, just kind of welcome your feedback as to what is that accurate? Why do you think this is? And um, yeah, just be sort of interesting. I think on the budget cuts, I didn't see a lot of CMOs themselves get cut. Like I know that you have um, uh, the CMO from Trip Actions, which is a travel-based organization that for sure had huge hit in uh, COVID, right? They cut a ton of her team. I met with her and um, they, they cut the team, but they didn't cut her. 
They view her as a strategic resource. It also takes people an immense amount of time to find a great CMO for their organization. So the amount of energy, time, and effort to kind of go find that person, I think maybe the CMOs themselves didn't get cut, but for sure, I think the first thing in every company was how do we slash the marketing budget? Because the marketing budget is one place where there are variable dollars. Like we just call them variable dollars. It's like, what programs are you going to do? And do you have to do them? And that's where this partnership with the CFO is so important because if they understand what you're doing and you can really validate you know, back to revenue versus leads or just a fluffy sort of like, oh, there's going to be buzz in the market kind of metric, you can defend your entire budget, I think. Um, I mean, in a pandemic, when you're making the choice on do you lay off a whole company or do you cut marketing dollars, I think you're going to cut marketing dollars. But I mean, in the end of the day, I think um, that's an important thing. And that's why it is important to be aligned with your CFO. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, certainly uh, the discretionary dollars uh, from events immediately went away, which is, of course, a benefit to everyone. And so that, that was an easy one to give up. It was a lot harder to give up other ones. Uh, we decided to sort of zig when everyone else was zagging. We saw that people were spending less. And so we found that our cost per clicks in Google were more reasonable. Uh, we could get sponsorships and do some advertising a lot less expensively. Uh, there was less noise going on in the marketplace. And so for our particular market, at least, uh, it was a chance with similar spending to have a much higher share of voice because our competitors weren't quite spending as much. So it was a really good opportunity. I think also we sort of changed strategies a little bit uh, under COVID and we wanted to embrace our current customers a lot more than net new, just to make sure everyone's in the boat and everyone's good. We have 100% of the Fortune 100 as our customers, which is wonderful, but that means we have all the airlines, all the hotels, all the cruise ships, and uh, we wanted to be extra generous with them during COVID. And so we said, stay our customers, no charge until business gets back on its feet. And we thought that was really goodwill. And we didn't see too many other companies extending that sort of, uh, that sort of partnership with them. And we think as people are starting to come out now that we've really formed a really great relationship and they appreciate that we did something special in this very uh, you know, unique time. Slashing the uh, the events budget wasn't good for everybody, uh, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just meant it was a level playing field. But, you know, I will say, Alex, you guys reinvented yourselves from physical events to virtual events. And yeah. I, I think all these marketing teams were scratching their heads. How are we going to do it? Well, everyone managed to do it. And yeah. we're finding from a ROI point of view, it's been pretty good. Although I find engagement really uh, a challenge when people can multitask and you're getting bombarded with messages while you're on a, on a, a virtual meeting. I do find there's something about getting on a plane and putting your butt down in Moscone, like you're all in, <laughs> like you're going to talk to people and you're going to listen to the session and you're going to meet people. But uh, we haven't found the kind of engagement for the most part in virtual events that we had in physical events. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely different uh, uh, for sure. And I, I think what we're seeing with virtual events, which you, you've probably seen, is that let's say you're running a four hour kind of virtual event, people will kind of pick and choose the talks that they want to see or the time that they want to spend. And then they won't necessarily, or certainly almost will never stay for the whole amount. And they'll be doing bits and pieces and then maybe watch it, you, you know, on replay, uh, you know, afterwards. Uh, so, uh, yeah, very, very different experience. But like, you, you know, uh, uh, as you say, when, when SASCOT was in Dublin, you know, people from 74 countries would fly over you know, there for the week. You're in it, you know, morning, noon and night, uh, you, you know, as well. Coming back exhausted, which you don't get with virtual events. Uh, but, um, but yeah, definitely you get the exhaustion. You just don't get the parties and the fun. I mean, exactly. like, I don't know what's a good trade off here. Exactly. It's a different kind of exhaustion. I think one, when we did our first virtual event, actually the first SAS remote, which I think you spoke at, uh, Tricia, yeah. we, we, for whatever crazy reason, we decided it, it, it was two days and 10 hours per day to cover Europe and the U S. Uh, and so I literally, well, sat there for, for 10 hours, both days, watching some fantastic talks. And by the end of it, I mean, I was exhausted kind of mentally, but I hadn't walked any steps, right? And so, you, you know, I, my feet were, you know, perfectly fine. Uh, whereas if I had been, you know, uh, at Dreamforce or, or at Sastock or whatever, I would have probably done 20,000 steps a day and been physically uh, exhausted uh, uh, as well and wouldn't have slept much because it, there's so much fun. It's, yeah, the fun is the part is, uh, is missing, right? So, uh, uh, for sure. Yeah, I want to get back to your question about the tenure of a CMO, yeah. because I think this is something that um, is spoken about a lot. And it goes back to the point I was making before in terms of how marketers need to sign up for revenue. I think one, when companies are in different, you know, growth stages, 
people look for different things in a CMO, right? Like who's the person who's super scrappy, they can kind of set things up, who's the person who can scale, et cetera. And depending on how long it takes for companies to go through those stages, a lot of time that indicates, you know, when you change. And when I talk to other CMOs, a lot of times I'm talking to people who are new in their role and it's because the request of what they wanted from marketing or the CMO has dramatically changed. And I think that's something people overlook, which is the CMO role is really a big role in driving change in an organization. And the people who can drive change and do it across different time periods of the growth of a company are the people who can actually um, maintain a fit within a company for a longer period of time. I think you're spot on about there's a sweet spot for every CMO. Like I'm the early stage or I'm the expansion or I'm the public company CMO. And very often a company sort of uh, outgrows the CMO skills. I think with a CFO, it it has a much more lifetime uh, expansion, but sort of the tactical things and how hands-on you are. Someone who's very hands-on with a four-person marketing team is not going to be able to handle a hundred-person marketing team very easily unless they're a very sophisticated person. So I think you're right. Um, it's, I think also part of the 10 year challenge is setting expectations with the CEO. Like everyone has a different idea, like, oh, it's a branding thing, or it's about content, or it's all about pipeline. Like, I think the salesperson has an expectation, the CEO, the CFO, everyone's got a different expectation. And I think in the interview process, you have to really be crystal clear about what you're going to do and what's in the domain, because every CMO job is slightly different. But if you try to be all things to all people, I think you're going to fail pretty quickly. Yeah. Just con- conscious of time, have you got any final uh, sort of mistakes that you want to share, uh, perhaps sort of one or two, uh, uh, before we uh, wrap up? I think back to sort of the alignment and what uh, Brian was just saying is, I think marketers need to realize that they really have a very powerful position today in a company because the brand is so important and customer experience is so important. The world is so noisy. Catching people's attention and really locking in is the key thing that you need to figure out as you align then to the end result, which is growth for your company, which is usually revenue. And so marketers need to realize it's not just about the brand. It's not just about the leads. It's about revenue and revenue comes from new business. But Brian talked about earlier during COVID, we all realized it comes from your existing customers. Customers. And so you need to think about the full experience from that first touch all the way through the buying, then to the onboarding, then to the expansion, then to hopefully advocacy where your customers love you so much that they're doing your marketing for you and you can go on vacation. So, I mean, I think this is a really key thing. Like, don't think so narrowly about what your role is. Think about the power of what marketing can bring to a company in aligning sales, service, marketing, even product to make sure that you're going out as a unified group of people, including your employees. Like one of the things I love about my job is I own employee brand. So what is that experience for every time we post a job and somebody interacts to interview and then they get onboarded? Like that is a part of your brand as well because your employees are direct you know, facing into the world of your brand. I think this unification really points to the chief role of the CMO. And that is you're the storyteller, like you create the narrative and it's a narrative that works for your employee brand. It works for prospects, current customers. And so at the end of the day, creativity and great storytelling is something that CMOs have to do. I think we've leaned so much to the left side about conversions and how many campaigns and numbers and dashboards. I think we forget sometimes And sometimes uh, all CMOs are not good at both sides, left brain and right brain. You know, I definitely, because my years in marketing automation, I'm much more left brain. And so I have to supplement myself with an agency or creative people and copywriters and art directors. But I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, the creativity and the storytelling is really central to the role and it unifies the whole company. Well, uh, it's been fantastic speaking with you both uh, and, and learning from you. Uh, in this uh, episode of the SaaS Revolution show, uh, really as a, I guess, kind of precursor to a blueprint for CMOs. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. And I think obviously the, the CMOs that will be listening to this and, and in attendance are uh, uh, certainly in for a treat. Uh, so really excited for a blueprint for CMOs on, on March the 30th. Uh, you can go to sasbot.com uh, forward slash blueprint to, to find out more. Um, Tricia, Brian, uh, any final words? No, I'm looking pleasure. forward to attending and I'm looking forward to speaking. So I can't wait to be a part of um, the Blueprint for CMOs. It's a great day.
Me too. I can just tell by this exchange, I've already learned a whole bunch of things. I got a whole bunch of notes here from Tricia. So <laughs> I'm really looking forward to, uh, to, the, to the March Blueprint meeting. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Thanks, Tricia Gilman, CMO at Drift, and Brian Cardin, CMO uh, at Envision. Uh, we'll see you both on March, uh, March 30th at Blueprint for CMOs.